Why would a Muslim become a Christian? It's a good question. The Qur'an teaches about sin, just like the Bible. The Qur'an teaches that there's only one God, just like the Bible. The Qur'an teaches about heaven, it teaches about hell. It even teaches about Jesus being on the cross, just like the Bible. Okay, so we're less than 30 seconds in and there's already red flags. Teaches about Jesus being on the cross, just like the Bible. Quran 4157, while in fact they did neither kill him nor crucify him. Yeah, just like the Bible. Let me share with you some of the fun things that the Quran teaches. Things about history, things about men and women, things about Allah and who he is. Let's start in Surah 18, verse 86. Till when he... The traveler Zul Qurnain reached the setting place of the sun. He found it going down into a muddy spring. The traveler here, Zul Qurnain, is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, according to who? Here, Tafsir ibn Kathir. Tafsir al-Tabari? Now, we can argue that this is all just poetic writing and that the Quran doesn't actually mean that he found where the literal sun sets and that it literally sets in a muddy spring. But there's more to this passage. Surah 18 is long and I won't read the whole entire thing. But what Surah 18 suggests is that Alexander the Great was a Muslim. Historically, we know that that's not accurate because Alexander the Great lived some 1,000 years before the Prophet Muhammad did, and he himself was a Greek pagan. Okay, great. You don't think it literally means the sun goes to water? So your only issue is that it's talking about Alexander the Great? And your argument is, well, it's in Surah 18, but uh, it's really long, so just trust me on it. And no mention of Alexander the Great. So... So Muhammad is the prime example for all Muslims on how they ought to conduct themselves. And then Jesus Christ is the prime example for all Christians on how they ought to conduct themselves. So let's take a look at the difference between those two characters. So let's start in Surah 8 verse 12. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. This is Allah speaking to Muhammad, and then Allah gives Muhammad instructions for himself. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. Maybe if you underlined the whole verse, you'd see when your Lord revealed to the angels. In the Quran, it states that the angels fight alongside the Muslims in battle. Surah 9 verse 5. Again, this is Allah speaking to Muhammad. Slay the unbelievers wherever you find them. Take them captives and besiege them and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Surah 9 verse 13. Fight those that fight you. Okay? Finally, let's take a look at Sahih Bukhari. Quick explanation here. Sahih Bukhari is a continuation of the Qur'an. It documents more of the things that Muhammad did. So this is like the Gospel of John compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's overall the same story, but it goes into other details about the things that Jesus did that may not necessarily be found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But overall, the story is still the same. Sahih Bukhari is just like that when it comes to the Quran. Wrong. The Gospel of John is canon of the New Testament. The Gospels are to be read aloud in worship on par with the Old Testament. Bukhari cannot exist and nothing would change. Bukhari is a continuation of the Qur'an, whatever that means. And story? What story? Does Rhys think the Qur'an is a storybook of Muhammad, just like how the Gospels are a storybook of Jesus? I mean, the Qur'an does mention the Prophet's life a few times, but it's not a story of him. Let's take a look here at Sahih Bukhari 52 verse 44. Verse, these aren't ayat, they're not verses, they're hadith. 
Again, Bukhari is not scripture. A man comes to Muhammad and says, Muhammad, is there anything that is as good as jihad that I could possibly do to get a reward in heaven? Now, for those of you that don't know, jihad is committing atrocities in the name of Allah. It's commonly referred to as holy war by Muslims, but the actions of jihad mean committing atrocities in the name of Allah in hopes to reap a reward in heaven. Hmm, commit atrocities. Uh, yeah, I, I might need some help with that because uh, I can't find it anywhere. So let's look at Muhammad's answer here. Muhammad replied, I do not find such a deed that is equal to jihad. So the greatest accomplishment you could possibly achieve as a Muslim is to commit horrendous atrocities in the name of Allah. Let's see what Buhari 56 verse 1 says. After praying and being good to your parents, then jihad, then more. So even if you wanted to read it backwards and say the last is the best, which doesn't make any sense because when asked about the best deed, the first answer was praying on time, but whatever, there's still more after jihad. For example, let's take a look at verse 3. The best jihad is hajj. Including beheading people, dismembering them, and just killing people in general. A person who dies during jihad is called a shaheed. So let's see if being a shaheed is by committing atrocities. Drowning? Atrocity! They're taking up the water supply, dying to protect their family. What an atrocity! How dare they save their family? Dying by giving birth. Atrocious! Only a wicked person would give birth to a Muslim. Oh, people of the book. That's Muslims. Wrong again. These are Jews, Christians, and Sabians. Read three verses earlier. 565. After talking about Jews, says... Had the people of the book only been faithful and mindful, we would have certainly absolved them of their sins and admitted them into the Garden of Bliss. Had they observed the Torah and Gospel in what was revealed to them from their Lord. Heck, even in the same verse, in your Lord's revelation to you will cause many of them to increase in transgression and disbelief, so do not grieve over the disbelievers. According to this verse, it's the Bible that has the final authority and final say over the Qur'an. It's the Bible that validates the Qur'an. So much so that Muslims have no ground to stand on unless they read the Torah and the Gospel. Well, if that's what the Qur'an says, then that's what I'm going to do. And then this is where he bases the rest of his video and his conversion on. A verse he misreads and then claims, The Qur'an says that the Bible is greater than the Qur'an. Checkmate, Muslims. Let's take a look at some of the teachings and actions of Jesus Christ. Let's start in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 43 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Let's stop right there. This is a very familiar concept. In fact, if you're a Muslim, this makes perfect sense. For somebody who is a fellow Muslim like you, you're to treat them with love and respect. But somebody who is an unbeliever, you are to strive hard against them, just like we read in the previous surahs. So far, so good. But Jesus Christ completely changes the narrative here. Matthew 5 verse 44. But I say to you, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. God causes the sun to rise on both the good and the evil. He causes the rain to fall on both the good and the evil. This is describing God's common grace. God gives common grace to all men. Therefore, if we strive to be like God, but we only give our common grace, such as greeting or loving somebody, if we only give our common grace to people that we love and not the people that don't love us, what good does that do? 68. Allah does not forbid you from dealing kindly and justly with those who have neither fought you nor driven you out of your homes. Surely Allah loves those who act justly. Allah only forbids you from those who fight you 
because of your religion and expel you from your homes and support you in your expulsion from making allies. And whoever makes allies with them, then those are the wrongdoers. This doesn't mean to hate people that don't support you. You can have polytheists that don't like you, but so long as they don't attack you, be nice to them. It's not about them loving you. It's about them not oppressing you. Standing up against oppression isn't a bad thing. What are you, a madkhali Christian? It happened, but you can use your imagination when I say that there were death threats. It was quite violent. And as a matter of fact, one of my family members looked at me and said, I'm your God. To which I replied, no, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Cool story, I'm sure that happened. You know, the typical Muslim belief to proclaim yourself to be the God of the Christians. In all seriousness, I'm not gonna doubt Reese's story. The typical Muslim response would say, yeah, I doubt you're even a Muslim. Let's say he's telling the truth. Let's say that he is an ex-Muslim Christian convert. What's clear, to me at least, is that Reese became a Christian then worked his way backwards to try and attack Islam. That's why he's grasping at so many straws. Uh, uh, Alexander the Great is called a Muslim in the Quran. Uh, uh, Surah Toba. Uh, uh, Bukhari is Quranic canon. It's something that even ex-Christian Muslim converts do as well. Once they adopt their new belief, they now make it their mission to attack their old belief and become a token for their new religion. Heck, even I might be guilty of this myself with this whole ex Salafi shtick. Oh, wait, but apparently I wasn't a Salafi in the first place. And you know what? Now that I think about it, I wasn't even Muslim in the first place. So, uh, yeah, never mind. It doesn't actually work for me. Wassalamu alaikum.